so I got semi-restless, so, you know, I always get a little excited when I'm about to talk about one of my favorite ancestors, but I think part of my story is that this is not an ancestor that for a hundred years anybody ever heard his name. And it's kind of a funny story, actually. Um, one of the branches of my family, I do things besides my Oklahoma research, uh, one of the branches of my family comes from Giles County, Tennessee. And Giles County, Tennessee is what people would refer to part of Middle Tennessee. And people who are Tennessee researchers would know what that would mean, which is if you take Tennessee to a little sort of horizontally shaped state. It's literally in the middle. And um, our family, were, our ancestors were enslaved in Giles County. The slaveholder was a major John Bass of Elkton, Tennessee. And uh, he passed away in 1860. And um, at that point, the family, as happens to many families that are enslaved, once the slaveholder passes away, the slaves are often divided when the estate is settled. And some of, the, some of the people in the family remained in Tennessee in the area were divided out among family members and um, some were sent to other states. My great-grandfather, the branch of the Bass family from which I come, ended up in Sevier County, Arkansas. It was still to a real person related to the Bass family. And my grandmother was born, uh, my, my dad's mother was born in Horatio, Arkansas in Sevier County. Now, in 1860, at the time, the slaves were divided. It, um, he died in testate, which means that he did not have a will. However, there was an estate inventory. There was an administrator of the estate. And his property, his human chattel property, they were listed as part of the estate. And of course, I was very surprised. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Murphy, was with me in Salt Lake City when I had discovered a particular record and it was the estate inventory that listed all of the people who were enslaved by Major Bass at the time of his death. And of course you see numerous people who were there and we already knew the names of my great grandfather's parents, Irvin and Nancy. He named his first two children, Irvin and Nancy, after his own parents. He was separated from them um, in 1860, as I said, upon the death of the slaveholder. But you see the names among those who were enslaved. You do see Urban. You see two Nancys, Big Nancy, Little Nancy. You see the names. But it was still something. I didn't know who a lot of these other people were. However, I did see, I was very surprised to see the name Mitchell. And there's my great grandfather's name on that estate. Now, my great grandfather spent the rest of his life in Arkansas. And you can see a picture of him, Lewis Mitchell Bass. But as far as we knew, the rest of the family remained in, in Tennessee, in Giles County. But it was very, very interesting because we learned that part of the family, some did leave Giles County. Some, in fact, moved to another part in, in uh, Middle Tennessee, to Rutherford County, to Murfreesboro. And so we knew we did have a few cousins. Um, and I wasn't really sure, was there a lot of contact with their letters exchanged? Who knows? But we knew that there was some other connection to Murfreesboro. And that was the family of one of my great-grandfather's brothers, John Silas Bass. He later moved in the early 1900s from Murfreesboro to Kansas, to Iowa, Kansas. Now, about, I guess um, eight decades later, middle of the 20th century, late 20th century, at a family reunion in Kansas City. Um, I'm not sure who organized the reunion, but it was decided, hey, there are a few of us in Kansas, most of us who come from Arkansas, and a lot of the Arkansas people had migrated west to Arizona and California, but we we're still in touch. And it was decided, why not have a reunion? At least get these two little branches, even though there were other people we know from that estate record who were probably relatives, but we don't know that. And so some uh, individuals decided to have a reunion in 1989 in Kansas City. So we learned a few facts. People were, we asked some of the elders to share anything that you know. And um, 
it was shared, for example, and no one knew this, especially in the Arkansas clan, that in 1888, the family, the Bass family, still living in Giles County, had been attacked by night riders. The family was attacked. And apparently, the patriarch of the family, Urban Bass, was killed in that attack. And so other stories were told. Uh, how about the folks who moved to, to Murfreesboro? Well, um, yes, they eventually ended up being the branch that ended up in south, southeast Kansas, Iowa, Kansas. Oh, and also it's another story. Somebody in the family shot a white man and ran away to Texas. Well, of course, the question was really, uh-oh, who was this? Who, who did this? What happened? What was the situation? He shot a man and had to run away to Texas. And so that was sort of the question of the day. Well, who was it? Who was it? Now, the children, my grandmother had a large family, a lot of siblings. Her youngest brother, who was uh, George Bass, he was the last person in the family that ever heard that story. And he had said, well, you know, we're not supposed to talk about that. Because he had to run away to Texas, and nope, we're not supposed to talk about it. Finally, our cousin uh, Joseph, well, we call him Buddy, Cousin Buddy, he went up to him and said, you know, they're all dead, you know. <laughs> it's okay to say his name. What is his name? And it was kind of reluctance on his part, but he was sort of being prodded by everybody at the reunion since you know something, you heard it when you were a child, what is it? And it was kind of reluctant. Well, his name was Cephas, Cephas Bass. Well, as a genealogist, all you need is a name, at least a name is a beginning. So I started a quest once I heard about Cephas. Now, of course, I really didn't begin uh, a lot of, I would say, extensive genealogical research until I had moved closer to Washington, D.C., and I had access to the National Archives. And at that point, I said, well, maybe I can find something in the Cephas Bass. But how do you spell Cephas? S-E-P-H-A-S, C-E-P-H-A-S, U-S, oh, how do you spell Cephas? And of course, we know one of the golden rules of genealogy, spelling does not count. And so I went looking for a Cephas Bass. And he lined up, he shot a white man and ran away to Texas. So maybe I'll look in Texas for somebody called Cephas Bass. Wherever, Texas is a big state. How many counties are there? Over 200 counties? Something like that. Had no idea. But I had a little bit of luck. In 1910, there was an older man called Cephas Bass living with a family uh, of Pools, P-O-O-L-E. And I was really surprised to see that. I said, okay. But what really intrigued me more than seeing a man, because Cephas, there are a few people called Cephas in the world. This man in Texas, Fayette County, Texas, was born in Tennessee. Hmm. Okay, well, I, my Cephas was born in Tennessee. But just because I see a Cephas from Tennessee, that does not mean that that is my ancestor. You have to have a lot of corroborating evidence. But I had some more luck. Because when I found him, I found him in 1910 with some people called Pooh. A name didn't register, didn't mean anything. But I looked 10 years earlier and I found a Cephas Bass still living in the same community but he was living with a brother called Napier. And if you remember on that estate record from the slaves that were listed of uh, Major John Bass, there was a Napier in the household. Napier was also a name that has lasted through several generations. The one who moved to Kansas, and I'll talk about him in a second. He had a son named him Louis Napier Bass. Uncle George, the one who revealed Uncle Cephas' his name, his name is George Napier Bass. So I'm seeing him in his 1900 census living with a man called Napier Bass. And my question was, oh wow, is this the original Napier from whom all these other Napiers have popped up in 
in subsequent generations, possibly so. But, okay, this is Siva's Napier that names in my family. So how could I truly find out that this was the same Cephas that shot somebody and fled to Texas? Of course, I wanted to know also why did he shoot the man? What, what was the situation with that, if this was the guy? Well, what are the facts? When you look at the census record, any census record for the first time, you take in all the details. Okay, there was a man called Cephas. He was born in Tennessee, but he was an old man. 1910, he was old enough to have possibly been a soldier, maybe. Could he have been maybe a Civil War soldier? Um, maybe I could find a few details. And would I be able to find, and there are a few places you can do this on Fall 3, or you can use the National Park Service database, Soldiers and Sailors database. It's free. So I put in the name Cephas Bass, and I found the name. Said Cephas Bass. Said he was part of some regiment called the 112th United States Colored Infantry. Now, once you see a regiment affiliated with a name of interest to you, well, now you've got to see. But where's this regiment from? This regiment was formed in Iowa and ended up fighting in Florida. That would not likely have been my Cephas. So I looked at the history of this regiment. The regiment was formed in North Alabama. But one of the, thing, one of the things that you have to learn when we're talking about genealogy, you just don't collect names. I know a lot of people who do collect names. And they'll say, oh, I've got 3,000 people in my family tree. But can you tell me 3,000 stories about those people? If it's just a list of names, I can give you the phone book in Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> knock yourself out, have a good time, add those names. But that's not genealogy. I want to be able to capture a story. So I looked up the history of that regiment, 111. They were formed in North Alabama. You've got to know your geography. I was telling you where Giles County, Tennessee is, but in relation to other states that surround Tennessee, Giles County, Tennessee sits directly on top of Limestone County, Alabama. This regiment was formed in that part of Alabama and they served most of their time in that region. So I said, okay, we could have been in the neighborhood, could have had that opportunity to join when they were recruiting colored soldiers, to join the U.S. Colored Infantry in that part of the country. So the next question was, okay, fine, I mean, I'll go and get his service record, which is not gonna give you details about the man, or at least I thought it wasn't, but what else can give me details about his personal life? Well, the God was smiling upon me. He filed a pension. And pension files of soldiers are a gold mine, an absolute gold mine. So I was able to read some things about this man. And but for him to be my Cephas. I still need to know that this guy in Texas, who was filing a pension, who was born in Tennessee, so all these things are, are adding up, I'm putting it together. But oh, I still wanna know, well, what is this? What's gonna connect him? So as I began to look at the document, and you can see some things there, that he talks about the fact that he enlisted in the 111th U.S. Colored Infantry at Sulphur Trestle, Alabama. Again, when you see a town or a place you don't know, find that place on a map so you can put that story in some context. This is a place where he was at Sulphur Trestle, Alabama. And he was saying, you know, who was the commander and what had other people who enlisted with him. And this was a surprise. I knew my great grandfather's name, Mitchell Bass. I knew that John Silas Bass had moved to Kansas. And now we possibly, possibly, had another relative, was he a brother, wasn't sure. But this man called Cephas reveals an interesting detail. And he mentions that he enlisted himself with one brother, Braxton Bass. Whoa, who? Who's Braxton? Well, he's clearly related to Uncle Cephas because 
It says that's his brother. But then he also goes on to say, he also enlisted with his two sons, Henry and Emmanuel. These are names that have never been known to this Arkansas branch of the family. We've never heard these names. And now we're getting Braxton and Henry and Emmanuel all coming from Cephas' file, which was really kind of exciting to see this. But then he goes on to say that he and Henry and Emmanuel, they were captured. General N.B. Forrest, CSA, captured us. And he talks about where they were around that place, Sulphur Trestle, Alabama. And I did confirm that. I looked up some official records. Yep, 111 U.S. Colored Infantry was captured at Sulphur Trestle, Alabama. So this was being confirmed. But then he goes on to say something that's really, really strange. First of all, he points out the fact that he actually ended up pulling me and my kinsmen together. So basically, they were being pulled apart from the rest of the prisoners that were captured. And a regiment is mostly, or nearly a thousand men. Which I'm like, why? 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 But then he says, well, he didn't guard us very closely. And we got away when we were near our home in Giles County. <laughs> and trust me, I'm at the National Archives in the reading room where one should be quiet <laughs> as you're reading files. And I'm looking and I'm saying, what? You gotta be kidding. And I'm saying this to a microfilm, uh, I'm not the microfilm, to this file that I'm looking at original documents I'm touching. And I'm saying, you've got to be kidding me. Now, why am I saying that in particular? I really had to stop. It was one of those wait just a minute moments. This man was captured by that man? Does anybody know who N.B. Forrest is? Fort Pillow. Fort Pillow. Fort Pillow was a massacre of black soldiers that occurred in the spring of 1864. It is said by many, it's debated by many as well. Well, he really didn't authorize what happened to happen. But he, of course, was the commanding officer. When, office, when um, soldiers had been captured, black soldiers, and there was a, a cry among many Confederate soldiers that, no, we will give no Negro any quarter. In other words, we're gonna take no Negroes as prisoners. These men were outnumbered, they surrendered, but they were massacred. They were not taken prisoners. And there was a lot of, of outrage that was expressed throughout just the nation about the massacre. This was not following standard military protocol. In a time of war, there are some general rules, even in war, that are followed. <laughs> if a party surrenders, they're to be taken prisoner. But we've got to remember what we're talking about. In an era of slavery, in a country whose economic base, in particular the agricultural base, was supported by slavery. The sentiment among many people whose lives were part of that slavery institution, they didn't have to be the slaveholder. They could have been the overseer who worked for the slaveholder. So here were these men, once enslaved, daring to fight at former enslavers with the muskets. And they were saying, no, we will take no Negro quarter. So the Fort Pillow Massacre is one of the major, major tragedies in terms of loss of life and uh, of soldiers. It became a rallying cry for other black soldiers throughout the war. Remember Fort Pillow. We will not give up. We are going to remember this. So I'm sitting here reading Uncle Sifa saying he's captured by Nathan Bedford Forrest. And he's saying, well, he didn't guard us very closely. So I'm astounded because number one, I'm thinking to myself, you lived to tell the story? Really? And then you escaped from this man? And of course, if one pulls up the actual, and you can go and find this on Fold 3, maybe find it on Ancestry, other, other um, sources as well. His service record, it actually confirms. He was captured, taken prisoner, and escaped. And of course, I'm thinking, well, see, I kind of like him. <laughs> he's a pretty, pretty interesting man. So it was very, very interesting for me 
to really try and put this together, though. And I guess my question was, okay, anybody who studies Civil War, at least you need to know a few names on who some of the players are. And Nathan Bedford Forrest is one of them. But I did have a question, just objectively taking emotion out of it. Why in a situation of war would a general of an army worry about prisoners? As I said, take the emotion out. Take the issue of race out. Why would a general worry about some, you know, enlisted men who are taken prisoner? Why would that? Why would he say take these four guys? And it was just really, really interesting to figure that out. And then I began to think about it a little bit later. And I realized, wait a minute, what's the story of Nathan Bedford Forrest? Where is he from? Pulaski, Tennessee. Where is Pulaski, Tennessee? It's in Giles County, Tennessee. It is the county seat of Giles County. My folks were enslaved by Major John Bass in Elkton. And down the road a few miles is Pulaski. So that's interesting. Okay. Now, of course, I don't think that as prisoners, they said, oh, uh, hey, uh, uh, you know, General Forrest, remember us? But I suspect that he may have recognized them. By training, by profession, Cephas was a carpenter. Braxton, I later learned, was a blacksmith. Major Bass was a man of prominence and wealth who lived down the road. Forrest, slave trader before his military service began. He was a big time man of wealth in the county. People know each other who have similar backgrounds, similar economic levels. The chances of his knowing Major Bass could have been pretty high. Braxton may have shooed horses for General Forrest, as far as we know, but that's only speculation. But I'm trying to think, why else? Why else would a general who was known for a massacre of soldiers have taken interest in enlisted? And sure enough, I saw something else that also caught my attention from the official records. And the official records, actually this is a summary of the letter that was sent to the commanding officer of the 111th U.S. Colored Infantry. And this is September 1864, when Cephas said in his pension file he was captured. But the letter said that was sent from Forrest to the officer of the U.S. forces in Athens, Alabama. This is near San Patrese. And he says, I demand an immediate and unconditional surrender of the entire force and all government stores and property at this point. I have sufficient force to storm and take your works. And if I am forced to do so, the responsibility of the consequences must rest with you. Should you, however, accept the terms, all white soldiers shall be treated as prisoners of war and the Negroes returned to their masters, which said, oh, if you recognize by any chance these four men, well, his goal eventually was to see that they would return. Well, it became very, very interesting because Uncle Cephas in his deposition goes on and he does tell the story. And he says, well, he kept me and my kinsmen and he didn't guard us very closely and we got away. So in other words, he had literally pulled these four men apart from all these other, almost a thousand men. And it was something that I just had to just think about. And I called uh, one of my close relatives in Oklahoma. He said, oh my God, I can't believe this. I found Uncle Cephas. And of course you thought, I found the man. I actually had met him. He was like, well, how did you do that? He must be really old. I'm like, now cousin. I found his record and I found part of his story. And so, I stopped and I said, well, let me put all this together. We're hearing about the story at a family reunion. We're hearing about this, this ranch from Kansas. And I had to look at that ranch in Kansas a little bit. The man who moved to Kansas, his name was John Cyrus Bass. He was the youngest son of the Tennessee Bass clan. Because if he was older, he probably would have joined the war with Cephas and Braxton and some of the others. 
But what was interesting was that he remained, and apparently he did not go to war like the others did. He was actually taken to war with one of Major Bass's family in the Confederate Army. His job as a body servant was to just banish people or do whatever else his young master was telling him to do. He was not a soldier, he was still a slave, of course. But he kind of got good at it. And he heard that there was a school um, opening up for colored folks. After the war, he asked him. And he wanted to go to that school. Maybe he learned some more things. And he enlisted in that school. He graduated from the second class of that school. Some of you might know the school, Meharry Medical School. He graduated in 1878. Dr. Bass became the first of four doctors in that family, his son, his grandson, and his great-grandson. And of course, that family became a very prominent family in Tennessee. Dr. Bass, uh, there was also a thumbnail sketch that was written. Thumbnail sketch is a light sketch about his life. And he talked about a lot of things in terms of how he had actually made a small escape when he was about to be whipped by um, someone in a family to whom he had been blown out, hired out. One of the things he talks about, though, after his life, they have returned. This is now still Giles County. He's now, he's now a physician. And the family's still in the Giles County area. And they have returned from a wedding. And this was in his thumbnail sketch. They returned from a wedding. And they were taunted by some local whites. And I started to try and put it together or try and put logic, I guess, to it, if, if one can call it that. And it dawned on me, here's a man who's a doctor. I'm sure he was a well-dressed man. Here are some local whites in the area. See this prominent family coming back in a nice carriage. And they began to taunt them. That evening, that family was attacked. And, uh, as he said, he was put on the roof, the back side of the roof, so he would not be hit by any gunfire. And apparently, they fought off as much as they could. He did say two of the attackers were killed. And I began to think, hmm, that's interesting. Details from the thumbnail sketch was that they were returning from a fairly fancy wedding. Uncle Sir, Uncle Cephas had been a Civil War soldier. This is 1888 now, war had been over more than 20 years. And then I began to also say, okay, well, he was a Civil War soldier, so was Uncle Braxton. The family was attacked by night riders. Uncle Cephas was infantry. He had a gun from the Civil War. I find him in 1919 census living in Texas. And then the words came back. Somebody shot a white man and ran away to Texas. Well, his name is Cephas. And I realized I had found Uncle Cephas. What was interesting, of course, the genealogist never stops asking questions, ever. So I wanted to know, well, what about his life? I saw what some people call pool. Who were his descendants? If he had any descendants that remain, and could any of them be found? Luckily, on one of my many visits to what I call, what my husband calls my home away from home, which is the National Archive, Washington, downtown Washington. I saw a woman at the National Archives. And in those days, most of the records you had to look at on the fourth floor of the reading room of the National Archives, this is in the 1990s, everything was on the fourth floor. And if you see people making copies of things, they're also in the same room, just up against the wall. And as you're walking back, maybe to your own desk, you can kind of look over someone's shoulder and see what they're looking at. And I was doing the same thing. I'm walking back and I see a lady, an African-American lady, and I see she's got Fayette County, Texas on her screen. 
Oh, hi, how are you? And she looked up and smiled. I said, I see you're doing Fayette County, Texas. So I'm not really doing this for my aunt. She gave me some names to look up. I said, do you know anything about any basses from Fayette County, Texas? Uh, she said, well, I don't personally. My aunt, who's um, sitting out in the, the waiting room area, she was born there. She might know something. I'm just doing this for her. And I said, okay, all right, well, thank you, I'm going to talk to her. And I was like, wow, okay. So I went and introduced myself. It was a sweet little lady, sweet little black lady. It was July. Do you know how hot it is here in July? Washington, D.C. is hot and humid and oppressive. And here was this sweet little black lady sitting on the sofa with a coat and a hat on. <laughs> and I'm thinking, she must be roasting. Bless her heart, but it was air conditioned. I guess she felt chilly and she had on her coat. And as I went and spoke to her and introduced myself, and she was a very sweet lady. And um, she said, well, you know, who are your people? And so I gave her some names and she said, well, I don't know, but I've got a sister who likes this kind of stuff. Just just write down your names and give me your phone number and I'll just pass it on to her. And I thanked her and gave her some names, Cedar Bass, Dr. Poole, some of the people I had seen on the and that was it. Two months passed, and I got a phone call from a lady in Atlanta. Hello, my name is Trudy Harris. I think you met my sister in Washington, D.C. This, this summer. So I had to think, because I meet a lot of people. And um, she said you had questions about people in Texas. Yes, the light bell went off. I said, yes. She said, well, you know, I don't know a lot about it, but I know a lady who knows everything about folks in LaGrange, because I had given her the town. And she said, I tell you what, I'm gonna call her, name is Miss Rose, and I'm gonna call Miss Rose, but don't say anything, you can listen. Because she doesn't like to talk to strangers a lot, and if she hears another voice, she will hang up the phone. <laughs> so oh, don't worry, don't worry. And so she calls up this lady, and they exchange greetings. Oh, hi there, Miss Rose, this is me, this is Trudy. No, hi, my name's Donna. Sugar, how are you doing? Just the sweet ladies. I'm listening to this conversation. And I'm like, just get me to other seats, you know? So, but I'm saying nothing. And um, she said, well, listen, you know what? We met this lady in Washington, D.C. And she's looking for people from uh, LaGrange. Well, who's she looking for? Me? And she said, well, she's giving me some names. Uh, she's got uh, 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 some basses and some pools. Yeah, I knew some of those I went to school with them. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. She actually knows these people. And she said, well, she said something about uh, 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 Mary, who was a bass, who married some man called Dr. Oh, yeah, 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 Mary Bass. She married Dr. Poole. And of course, I'm in my bedroom listening on my phone to this conversation. Ladies, you will especially appreciate this. I'm on my phone, I don't have a piece of paper. And of course, why don't I have a paper nearby? <laughs> So I found something to write with, but I saw this little blank thing to write on. How many of you remember, you know that little blank piece of cardboard that comes inside a package of panty pills? <laughs> well, I forget the pantyhose, I need this paper to write on. And so I just started taking notes as she's talking. Well, you know, I think, yeah. Well, you know, she had a uh, granddaughter called Josephine. I think Josephine, well, you know, after her husband died, they split up the boys. They sent them to different places to marry them and all those boys. And some of them, I think they all lived in Chicago. But one of them, though, I think he's doing something fancy. Uh, but he comes down here once in a while. I think he lives in Washington or somewhere. Oh, somebody does something. And, and somebody works at the White House. Like, you know, I'm just writing. Have um, the image that comes to my mind, what is the picture? I don't know if it's by Van Gogh, but it's like the silent screen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having that moment that I try to scream silently, but I am just having this moment. Anyway, um, she said, well, you know, I think I got his phone number somewhere, and all I hear is paper rambling. You just hear this. Is this her paper rattle? Oh my god, oh my god, I don't believe this. 
Well, I don't know. I can't find it. But if I find it, I'll just get it to you whenever I can because I don't know. I uh, live up in Washington, D.C. somewhere. I don't know. Uh, well, I sure thank you, Miss Rose. It's been so good. Well, Sugar, when are you going to come see me? So then I chit chat a little bit more. And I'm like, get off the phone. I got to scream. I'm going to tell somebody something. So anyway, the conversation ended in a few minutes. And then she called me back. Was that good enough for you? And I said, oh, yes. Miss Harris, you have made my day. And so I said, well, even if you never hear from her again, it doesn't matter. At least I know that this is the right family. And so we hung up, and about 15 minutes later, guess what? She found the number. <laughs> she kept looking. She kept looking. And she found the number. And of course, at this point now, it's too late in the evening to make a call, a cold call to a stranger. Yeah. So I waited until the next day at work. I worked uh, at that time, University of Maryland in the Graduate School Admissions Office. And I just closed the door to my office and got on and made that call. And a very sweet lady answered the phone. And uh, I stood and she said, hello. And a very sweet voice. And I said, yes, is this the, uh, and she gave me the name. Um, the man I was looking for was a Mr. Douglas. I said, is this the Douglas residence? She said, yes. Uh, is this Mr. Leroy Douglas's? residence. Yes, it is. Who's calling? I said, well, I'm kind of a long lost cousin. Uh, oh, and she kind of giggled. She thought that was kind of funny. Oh, okay. Okay. Hold on. And so this gentleman came to the phone. He said, uh, you know, hello. I said, is this Mr. Leon Douglas? And by this time, I had been doing some other things based on the notes that Miss Rose had given in terms of who this, these folks were. And I said, Mr. Douglas? And he said, yes. I said, were you from Chicago? Yes, that is correct. Was your mother Josephine? Her was her name, Josephine Johnson. Yes, she was. Do you know if her mother was Mary Bass Poole? Yes, it was. Who is this caller? I said, well, um, do you know if Mary Poole's father was a man called Cephas Bass? I've heard of that name. Who is this? I said, well. Um, we're probably related. Um, Seba's Bass was a brother to my great grandfather, Louis Mitchell Bass. It's like, really? I thought all those folks died out. I said, no, there are about 400 of us <laughs> who would love to meet you. <laughs> and he's like, really? And so I said, well, I did speak to uh, uh, a lady in Atlanta who happens to know Miss Rose in LaGrange. Oh, Miss Rose. Oh, okay. Then he got relaxed because I'm giving him now the name of someone who's her. I said, well, she shared some information uh, and she shared, your, she found your phone number and shared it with my friend who shared it with me. And he said, really? And I said, well, the following week, by the way, I see you live in Washington. I'm in the Baltimore County area, but uh, I'm going to be um, next Saturday in Washington because our uh, genealogical society is having a conference in Washington um, at the Hyatt, and perhaps you can feel free to come down there. There are a lot of exhibits you can look at as well. And so I said, what is this? And so I gave him the information. And so thankfully, I was able to meet Mr. Leon Douglas. That is his daughter, Kathy, who also researches family history. And she had no knowledge of any of this. Uh, we have sent me uh, we have sent uh, messages and exchanged uh, exchanged photos, and we stay in contact with each other. A lot of times on Facebook, because she's moved to New Jersey now. But there's a lesson from all of this. Part of the lesson is that okay, you get a few clues here and there, but sometimes even the clues that you get. You shouldn't always take those at face value because it might make you make an incorrect assumption. I heard some words. He shot a white man and ran away to Texas. So in my head, I made an assumption. Oh, Lord, one of our relatives went and shot some innocent man. I'm looking for, I was looking for a murderer. Shot somebody and run away but I found a Civil War hero, a defender of the family, 
He was a Civil War soldier in the United States Colored Infantry. He was a family man, a man who defended his family, a man who was forgotten for over 100 years. But he is a man that we will never forget. Thank you for listening to my story. On Are there any questions that I can ask for you about the research process or any databases or anything that I use to put some of this together? Any particular questions?